Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon's 90 minute webinar, Bioenergy in Tomorrow's Energy System, Decentralized Solutions for a Climate Neutral Economy. My name's David Rose, I'll be your moderator for the next 90 minutes. And I want to give you a little overview to start us off of where we're going to go with our session today. So as you can see on the screen here, five main steps to follow. I'm briefly gonna do a little introduction here, set some aims for today and get you our audience to give your initial views also here in an opening poll. We'll then move on to a brief opening interview with the General Secretary of Bioenergy Europe, where I'll be asking him about his vision towards 2050 and his expectations for today. We'll then hear a 10 minute presentation from Deloitte, who have on behalf of Bioenergy Europe carried out a study on the socio-economic and environmental impacts of bioenergy moving towards 2050. And then we'll move into our main course today, which is a debate with both the European Commission, European Parliament, industry, and also academia, looking at green deal proof opportunities and the way forward with bioenergy. We'll then wrap things up punctually with some concluding remarks. Now, let's have a look at how you can contribute to the debate today. I'll signal to you as we go through the webinar when we can take your questions, and I'll be taking those as moderator to give to our speakers, to our panelists. As you can see in the screenshot here in the bottom of the screen, you have the Q&A option. You can click on that and type your question in, which will come directly to me, and I'll be filtering those questions, choosing those, finding the most common areas, and sharing those with our speakers as we go along. Okay, so moving forward then, I want to have your views to kick us off today uh, in relation to the best design of the future energy system and how bioenergy fits into that. So I'm gonna bring up a poll now for you, as you can see here on your screen. I'd like you to choose one of the answers here. So our question is in your view, what's the best design for the future energy system? Our first choice, a more decentralized system providing opportunities for deploying locally available renewable energy sources and expanding access to clean energy services to rural and remote communities. Our second option, mostly electrified and counting on flexible generation, stronger transmission and distribution systems and increased storage capacity. Our third option, featuring a greater role for biorefineries, producing a spectrum of marketable products and energy within a circular bioeconomy. And products can be intermediates and final products, and including food, feed, materials, chemicals, and energy. And last but not least, a combination of all of these. That is a more integrated approach. So just take 30 seconds now, everybody, and choose which one of these you feel best represents what you think is the best design for the future energy system. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I do enjoy a good countdown, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see here from the uh, results on your screen, we have a clear leader of these four options in the fourth one, a combination of the above. So an integrated approach, but also notably some strong favor for the first of these, a more decentralized energy system with opportunities to deploy locally available renewables particularly with that emphasis there on energy services to rural and remote communities. So thanks for your views, everybody. And this is something we, our speakers will also see. And I ask them to bear in mind as we move forward in our debate. So having set some little bit of a framework for today and having also get your views as the audience to kick us off, I now wanna go straight into our second step, keeping time in mind as well. Well, I want to pose a few questions to Jean-Marc Jossard, the Secretary General of Bioenergy Europe. Good afternoon, Jean-Marc. Hello, good afternoon. Wonderful. So I've got a couple of questions just to kick us off today, just to get your views a little bit and your expectations for the event. So let me dig into my first question. As we know, today's event's looking at bioenergy as part of Europe's future. Now, Secretary General of Bioenergy Europe, how do you see the sector evolving in the coming decades? And what role do you think it's got moving forward towards 2050? Thank you. Good afternoon, David. So um, I, I think really overall the sector will continue growing. 
um, like we did in the last uh, dozens of years and being part of this uh, smart integrated system in the future. You might know that um, already today, Banerjee is more than 13% of the final energy consumption, which is significant role today and that's and it represents 60 percent of renewables so all in all uh, the bioenergy sector will be an essential element to achieve our challenge the main challenge is in reality to phase out fossil fuels and bioenergy can really help society to to, to do that um, it is growing really based on uh, on its cost effectiveness but um, as we will hear to, to today in the, in the panel, I think uh, there will be some innovation. And I would see three main drivers for this innovation, which would be flexibility, because Banerjee can be stored um, at a very cost-effective way. Uh, this is not the case for all uh, renewable electricity uh, pathways, for example. Second, um, Banerjee by nature is a decentralized production um biomass especially and it allows also the rural communities to participate to the energy transition and in the future this is also a key a key advantage and last but not least we can go even beyond carbon neutrality because energy can go negative in its emissions through the carbon capture and and the biochar which are one of the most affordable technologies to go for uh, negative emissions. And that's really a key innovation that we will see uh, in the investment in the future. Yeah, you are muted. You see future growth. You see that challenge of the transition away from obviously a fossil fuel based energy system that we have quite predominantly today. And you mentioned innovation in terms of flexibility, decentralization, and also negative emission technologies. I think we'll be very interested to hear from our panel afterwards as well, their views on both bioenergy carbon capture and storage and also biochar as opportunities moving forward. Okay, so coming on to my second question then, I've got to be honest, going back over the last few months, especially the back end of last year, the beginning of this year, I followed a very intense debate on bioenergy and sustainability, both at a European level, but also at a national and even local, local level across Europe as well. What are your reflections on this debate? Indeed, it is. I find it a pity somehow to have that kind of polemic around Banerjee, while we should see the sustainability framework as an opportunity. Um, indeed, Banerjee is the first energy source with mandatory sustainability criteria. Uh, this should be noted, and we have a kind of a chance, and we. Uh, we, we should develop a stable policy framework without unnecessary complexity. I think there is a, some, some risk uh, there for the moment. And we are, of course, at the critical point now with the Renewable G uh, Directive. Why do, you, do I say that this is an opportunity? Because uh, we can, if we do it right now, we can roll out this energy sustainability framework to other sectors, uh, other sectors between being other energy uh, sectors, but also food, feed, materials, and so on. So really, this is an opportunity. We should not see as a list of barriers to, to cap as much as possible by energy. It is really an opportunity for the future of our, of our energy system and the sustainability of, the, of it um, in particular. So quite clear then. OK, for you, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to set the criteria, could we argue, in the right way, such that not only does that work for bioenergy as part of the energy mix moving forward, but it also sets a good framework for other sectors that will inevitably also need sustainability criteria if we're going to achieve the sort of Europe that we're aiming for. Okay, wonderful. I'll move on to my last question then. Um, for my last question, it's really about expectations today. I see Niels. Niels, thank you for joining us from the European Parliament. If I could ask you politely at this stage, yep, just to mute your video and audio, thank you. So, sorry, Jean-Marc, uh, just moving on to the last question then, about expectations today. Um, what, what are you hoping for from today's debate, from today's presentation and debate? 
uh, two things mainly um, with the, the Lord report. Uh, now we have a chance to have um, a very uh, good uh, evidence-based report that should uh, that should really uh, be um, an input for the, the stakeholders uh, in the in the sectors, especially the policymakers as well. Um, and from the panel debate. Uh, I look forward to have a kind of a practical and solution-oriented debate for the, the future of our, of our energy system. And I have no doubt that the, the, both the industry, uh, the academia, and the, and the policymakers um, are, are, are really a solution-oriented uh, minds. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll pick up on your last point first there. I think yeah, definitely we can look forward to a good, robust and solution-oriented debate later. Not talking about what is, but really what's needed to move forward. And thanks for that lovely link to our next step, because I think many people would agree in this debate, it's about an evidence base. We need a solid evidence base to decide what the role should be moving forward. And in fact, with that in mind now, I'm going to say thank you to Jean-Marc for your in initial comments. And I'm going to transition on now to our next stage of our of our uh, event today, our webinar today. And I'm going to bring in Enrique Dohilio, the Director of Energy from Deloitte, to share with us over the next 10 minutes the key points of Deloitte's study that they've done on behalf of Bioenergy Europe towards an integrated energy system, assessing bioenergy, social, economic and environmental impact. So Enrique, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Bioenergy Europe for the invitation to elaborate this assessment and, uh, and to participate in this in this event. The light has uh, developed this, this assessment regarding the socioeconomic and environmental impact of bioenergy in Europe. Uh, we are going to introduce today the main uh, outputs of this, of this assessment. Uh, the, we relevant to the, this, this technology, uh, bio, bioenergy is the most important indigenous energy source. The production of primary energy in 2019 was around 132 uh, million of tons of, uh, of oil equivalent. We use, uh, we use in the assessment uh, 2019 as baseline because obviously the the result of COVID in 2020 can, cruise, can cause uh, confusion, and for the reason we use the, the figures of 2019. In 2019, the, the production of primary energy based on bioenergy was around 132 uh, million of tons of oil equivalent, and it supposed the most important uh, renewable energy uh, shows in the European Union. This was more than uh, double that in 2000, that in 2000 the level was next to uh, 73 million of tons of oil equivalent. Uh, the, the use of biomass uh, has different, uh, has different uh, forms. The most relevant is solid form based on the waste of forest, agriculture, livestock, uh, and industry waste. That is supposed 70% of the, of the bioenergy. Uh, Taking into consideration that uh, bioenergy is based on waste. In this case, we are using the waste of these uh, economic activities. It's also relevant the form of gases uh, based on biogas, that is 11% of the total production. Biofuel is 7% uh, of, the, of the total production. And obviously, it's also very relevant the, the waste that we use from municipalities that is supposed 12% of the total bioenergy that we have produced in, in the European in, in the European uh, Union, the target for uh, 2015 uh, 50, according with the different scenarios that European Union is producing regarding the use of bioenergy, is that in 2050 the total of bioenergy in Europe will reach around 220 million of tons of equivalent of oil equivalent. And in this case, it will be a 
and it supposed an increase of around 2% between the current situation to, to, the, to the forecast situation in 2050. Bioenergy has different applications in terms of energy. One of them is the production of heat for residential, for the uh, service sector, or for industrial purposes. Other also relevant uh, use of bioenergy is the production of electricity that can be consumed and is complementary to the rest of re to the rest of renewable energy uh, technologies because it introduces stability in the production uh, because in and is complementary to, for example, solar and wind energy because these technologies has high intermittent in, intermittent in, in, in has high volatility in the production and biomass allows uh, mitigating this impact in the in the electricity uh, system. Finally, uh, the production of, uh, neut of carbon neutral hydrogen based on biomass can be used based on electrolysis or based on gasification and is complementary to other renewable energy that can, the energies that can be used to, for the production of, of hydrogen. It's very relevant and it's something that you have commented previously that uh, Europe is one of the leaders in this technology. The, in Europe, we have the complete structure of the, of the value change in the bioenergy uh, uh, technology. Europe is leader in the manufacturing of equipment, of equipment and components, has large expertise in the construction of plants for the production of bioenergy, has uh, relevant players in operating these plants and to maintain them, and also is developed in the European Union the supply of the, of the fuel. Uh, around 70%, 74% of the bioenergy technology suppliers are based in the European uh, Union, and the, uh, this industry is a, a lever for business opportunities and job, crea and job creation all around Europe and mainly focus on the rural areas because most of the activities are developed in this, in this part of the territory. Additionally, based on the activity of the sector, there are other activities in other, uh, in other economy uh, sectors like uh, transport, gathering the raw material, uh, engineering and so on that uh, are affected by the sector because the sector is demand this kind of uh, services and this kind of goods for other activities and cause additional employment due to this demand. Regarding some of the most uh, relevant uh, outputs of the, of the assessment, we have estimated the contribution in terms of GDP of the sector in 2019 and in the previous year. According with our estimation, the sector generated around 34 billion of uh, euros in 2019. It's around 0.25% of the total uh, GDP in the European Union. We split this impact in two levels. One is the direct impact, that is the impact that caused the directly by the players in the, in the sector. In this case, this impact was around 24 billion of euros. And the indirect impact, that is the impact due to the demand of goods and services uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the players in the sector. Because how I commented, uh, is demanded uh, the gathering of the raw material, is demanded transport for the, for the biomass, is demanding engineering services, accounting, and, and so on. So this is the, the total contribution that we have estimated based on the public information that is uh, published by the uh, companies in the, in the sector and interview with some of the main players in this, in this industry. According with the forecast of the activity in 2050, we have estimated the future contribution in 
2015. Our estimation is that uh, the total contribution to GDP would reach around 56 billion of euros, taking into consideration that we are using base of euros uh, 2019 because we have not uh, forecast inflation in 2015 in order to, to estimate the real value of, of the money. According with this figure, it's supposed that around 0.42% of the GD, of GDP in 2050 would be uh, caused by the bioenergy industry. According with this, the figures that we have estimated, every uh, million of tons of oil equivalent of biomass for energy uh, generates around uh, 261 uh, millions of euros in terms of, of GDP. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have also estimated the number of professionals that were employed in 2019 by the industry. According with our estimation, around 800,000 professionals for in, in terms of full uh, time equivalent uh, of professional were engaged by the industry in 2019. The direct employment was around 600, 629,000 of professional and in direct impact uh, on other sectors due, due to the uh, the the indirect impact uh, based on the uh, carry carryover effect in the rest of the economy should be around 165,000 uh, of professionals. The forecast impact in, in impact in 2050 in terms of employment will be more than 1.2 million of professionals employed by the by the industry and every additional million of ton of oil equivalent of biomass for energy would suppose around 5,000 uh, full, uh, uh, um, full time uh, employment uh, in the, in, due to this, this activity. Bioenergy is also a, a smart solution because is a huge opportunity to generate value from low quality biomass, in this case is waste, because uh, the industry always use waste. And based on the use of residuals, the industry is, is able to create a value. In this case, it's complementary to the agriculture, life as uh, a stock, uh, food industry and other economic activities because based on this, this waste, the, the sector is able to create value and is an additional income for the, for, the, for the other players in the economy that has a problem and that is the waste and the, the industry has solved this, this problem in a smart way. Addition, additionally, the bioenergy produced, reduced the, the risk uh, of forest uh, fires, forest pests, illness, and so on, because the use of the, of the waste. Uh, the bioenergy has also a relevant impact in, in terms of uh, mitigation climate change. In according with the, with the um, methodology established in the Renewable Energy uh, Directive, we have estimated the mitigation of, C of CO2 emissions due to this, this activity. Our calculation is that in 2019, bioenergy save uh, 290 million of tons of CO2 equivalent. That is around 8% of the total emissions in the European Union and is 2.5 times the emissions of, for example, Belgium. The forecast for 2050 is that this amount will reach, will reach around uh, 487 million of tons of CO2 equivalent per, per year. 
a very additional million of ton of equivalent of, uh, of oil equivalent of use of biomass for energy mitigates around 2.5 million of tons CO2 equivalent. Biomass also it contributes to the, to the diversification of the energy sources and mitigating the energy dependency to third, to third countries. And additionally, the, the price of the biomass is more stable than the price of the traditional uh, fuels like natural gas, uh, petrol, coal, and, and so on. So it produces stability in the price of the energy. The main lessons learned during this, during this assessment is that uh, bioenergy is a lever for generating employment and wealth in Europe, mainly in the rural areas. It causes reduction in the energy dependency due to the use of autochthonous uh, biomass, has a key contribution to reduce the impact of the climate change in the European Union, it's a necessary renewable energy solution complementary to wind and solar energies because it uh, causes stable and predictable production that mitigates the volatility of the other renewable energy solutions. And it's a huge opportunity to create value from the smart use of waste. Um, thank you very much for, for your time and for your attendance. Thanks for your, uh, your key insights there from the report. Um, straight away from our chat, I have a question, in fact, which I'd like to just, well, two questions, very briefly, I'd like to put to you, Enrique, based yes. on the report. Um, the first questions come in um, from, I think, what would be an NGO? And ladies and gentlemen, in the questions, do please give an indication of, of whether you, re you represent civil society, industry, policymaker at national or European level because I'm always happy to use those questions. Now we have a question which I can only, I think, I think does come from the NGO or civil society perspective. Um, they're asking about the methodology that you used to estimate the social economic impacts. So yes. very briefly, could you just yes. give us an insight into very, very quick. your methodology? Well, yes, let me explain. Uh, according with United Nations, there are three different methodologies to estimate the contribution to GDP. Uh, one of them, uh, it can be used based on the financial statements of the players. Um, there are two alternative methods that you obtain the same result. If the first is you have the cash flow of the company and you have the you have the revenue, you have the salary of the of the people who are engaged by the companies. So if you take a company, for example, uh, you, you have Veolia that you mentioned previously. We go to the business of bioenergy of Veolia. We take the cash flow. We added the, the salaries that receive the, the professional. And this is the, the total contribution. Because if when, when you study at the university, you remember that one of, the, one of the methods to estimate the GDP contribution is the sum of the revenue that the owner of the business obtained plus the, the revenue that obtained the the professional who collaborated in the activity, and we use this method. Okay. Thanks, Enrique. I'll pause you there on that then. So you're yeah. using what's a well-established yeah. uh, yeah. global methodology. Yes. And or, uh, and let, let, me finish, methodology. Yes. And let me finish only for the for the employment. It's very similar because in the financial statements of Veolia, you have the name of professionals who collaborate in Veolia in the, in the bioenergy business. So you take this figure for that, and is this is the method. Excuse me. Oh, no, that's fine, Enrique. That's fine. And, and thanks to everyone that's sending the questions in. Some of the questions I've received related to what we've heard from Enrique, I'm holding for our debate that follows. But bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I will be using those questions. So keep them coming in. One, one last thing, just to perhaps wrap up then your sharing of the key points of the report from us, uh, mm -hmm. Enrique. And bear in mind, everybody, that this report is available for download, obviously, on Bioenergy Europe's website for everybody as a follow up to the seminar. Um, so Enrique, a little closing question for you. If you had to distill down the most important points from the report for you, the top priority three or four outputs from the study that you've carried out, what would they be as a takeaway for our audience? Well, one is that it's a lever for creation of value for the society and is complementary to traditional industries like uh, uh, food industry, agriculture, or 
for livestock. So it's complementary because it supposed an additional revenue for, for them. And we reduce a problem that this kind of activities has. The second is the complementary with the other renewables, and this is necessary technology because if not, we will have very low base production of electricity in the system, and we need a stable production of electricity to substitute uh, nuclear power generation or to substitute uh, combined cycles or coal power plants. And perhaps the Perhaps the, the most interested is that we are using something that didn't have value and it was a problem that is waste in order to produce energy. And it's a huge opportunity to create a value from something that didn't have value. Okay, thanks Enrique. So thanks for your little summary there at the end. And thank you for taking the time to share the insights from the report with us. I know some of the points you've raised about the socio-economic part, the environmental part, and also other aspects you've brought in or form part of our debate that follows. So as mm -hmm. I mentioned to our audience, keep those questions coming in and I'll do my best to raise as many as I can and from all perspectives that I can during the debate. So thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, thanks thank for you your time. Much. Thank you now. So moving on then, ladies and gentlemen, to the next stage, I mentioned five steps in our uh, webinar today. It gives me great pleasure now to transition into what I call the main course today, which is our, our panel and our panelists are waiting for us. Let me briefly introduce them then, representing the European Commission from DG Energy. We have the Director of Green Transition and Energy System Integration, Katarina Sikov-Magni. We have Niels Torvalds MEP from the Renew Europe Group from the European Parliament, who's a member both of the Envy Committee and also the Rapporteur on the Renewable, Renewable Energy Directive. We have Camilla Wakieja, the Director of Energy and Public Affairs at Veolia, a company active in energy, waste management and water supply and management. And last but not least, we have Julien Blondeau, who's a professor at VUB in Brussels, whose areas of expertise include biomass, thermodynamics, combustion, thermal power plants and also waste. So without further ado, I'd invite all of our speakers to switch their cameras and microphones on, and off we go. So warm welcome to all of you, Katerina, Niels, Camilla, and Julian. And I wanna get straight down to business now then. In our panel, we're focusing on bioenergy and tomorrow's energy system. We're talking about decentralized solutions. We're looking at that 2050 carbon neutral economy, which is so talked about. I wanna get straight down to business. Camilla, uh, Katerina, I'm gonna come first to you with a question just to get things started. Then Niels, I'll come to you. And then Camilla, and last but not least, Julian. I'd ask you to keep your initial answers brief if you can, please. So getting straight down to things, Katharina, the European Commission's presented obviously several climate change mitigation scenarios in the Fit for 55 proposals. And you've considered bioenergy as a solution in all of those. So my question is, what from your perspective can the bioenergy sector do to make itself better ready to meet the challenges of this 2050 transition. Thanks, David, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to be here today uh, to discuss uh, this very important uh, sector. Uh, so if I start from our legal framework, and there, of course, the Green Deal uh, is the key uh, policy framework to uh, lead Europe to climate neutrality by 2050 in a cost-effective path. And you referred to the different scenarios that we have built up, be it for 2030, be it then also uh, on the way to 2050. In all these scenarios, uh, bioenergy does play a role, an important role uh, in getting us to carbon neutrality. Uh, today, uh, we have 20% of renewables in our energy mix. And out of this 20%, something like 60% comes from bioenergy. Uh, this share is expected to remain relatively uh, stable until 2030, but then increase uh, considerably after that and in the running to 2050. Uh, so what do we need to do? We need to put in place uh, the legal framework. We need to work on uh, the incentives for investment. And we do believe that these uh, are in place with the package 
of legal proposals that the Commission adopted last summer. So the so-called famous Fit for 55 package, complemented by the package on uh, hydrogen and renewable gases uh, of December. Uh, so we do need uh, a lot of different type of energy, energy uh, into the system, and there is no single solution. We will need more wind and solar, uh, we will need more electrification in general, and we will need biomass, be it liquids or biofuels, uh, will pay, play a new key role. So I think what is important for the sector now is to uh, look into uh, what are the uh, best uses, what are the best technologies as they are today, uh, what are the technologies that could be there in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, uh, and start uh, working on these aspects. Um, what is also important is that we, uh, as the policymakers, uh, get the feedback from your work. If you feel that there are hurdles on the way, if you feel that there are obstacles that prevent you from uh, going for, for more decarbonized options, then please do let us know. Uh, but it is important that we policymakers, business, industry, citizens, consumers uh, work together uh, on the future system, which will be much more integrated than it is today and will be at the same time more, more centralized with, let's say, a lot of offshore wind, for instance, but even more so, much, much more decentralized. Uh, so uh, basing itself on local, uh, local production and consumption. So that's just to kickstart the options, opportunities are there, they are huge, and we need to start investing uh, very much to get there. Thanks. Okay, thanks for your initial comments, Katharina. I'd be interested to pick up some of those, and I'm sure our panelists will have to as well. But with that in mind then, Niels, I'm going to move over to you just to get things started. And of course, as I mentioned before, and as you would know very well yourself, your rapporteur on the Renewable Energy Directive for the Envy Committee, from your perspective, in that role, and, and obviously your background and experience as well, what for you are the key measures to take to, to have bioenergy delivering what we heard a little bit from the Deloitte report? On the one side, the socioeconomic part of the argument, but equally very importantly, on the other side, also environmental impacts. Thank you, David. I'll try to be as short as possible, but uh, in my mind, probably the most uh, or my, my, uh, if I could actually start from another angle. Sometimes uh, politicians are fairly stupid. That's news for you, of course. You haven't heard that before. Uh, but there is a tendency when we have this discussion in, in the parliament and in national parliament that you can sort of jump from the situation of today, from alpha, and then you jump over the whole alphabet into a new situation in seconds flat, from alpha to omega. In, in one great leap. And that doesn't actually work. So I started to rethink the situation already, I think in September, October, and I started to be afraid of where are we going to land? Are we going to all of a sudden run into a shortage of, 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 of energy? And if we have a short, shortage of energy, then we will run into, in, into a, a price hike. And if you run into a price hike, then we're going to have people sort of uh, not having en enough money for, to, to cope with the situation. So what I was trying to figure out was a, what I would call a rational usage of, of, of energy during a, a transitional period. Uh, and if you look at the, the small problems we now how, have with the with the taxonomy. I think one of the shortcomings of the taxonomy was that, uh, that we all of a sudden with the gas and, and nuclear decision coming up from the commission, we jumped from one way of looking at the problem to another way of looking at the problem. We sort of changed the rules in midway. And, and I, I don't think that's a, a very good decision. And therefore, what I'm trying to get on the table is a approach where we see a transitional period. 
And during that transitional period, we are forced to accept different for, forms of energy, also slightly risky forms of, of an energy, just to be able to escape a situation where we, 10 years down the road, all of a sudden see that, oh, we have a heap of problems. And then we are sort of backing out of all the, the, the decisions we have made about, about uh, biodiversity and, and uh, sustainability. So what I'm trying to tell people, that we need a transitional period. We need to look down, let's say 15 years down the road and understand in which way companies make their investment decisions and thereby creating a, a, a a space for making those investments in a feasible and sustainable way. And in the best of cases, we then 15 years down the road, we might be able to take the next, next step and find the ideal solutions for, for, for reaching the goals for, for 2050. But we have to see that this has to be done in, in steps. We can't sort of, jump over the problems we have. And we already now see that we have price hikes coming. What I was sort of trying to understand in September, October, all of a sudden became a reality. And we might be running into bigger problems if we are not, if we are not sort of trying to find the intermediate solutions for the moment being, keeping in mind what we have to achieve uh, before 2050. So that's that's in short what I'm trying to do with the with the red tree. Then if I'm succeeding or not, that's that's going to be seen. Someone once told me, in fact, that, that that sometimes there's a little bit of a gap at the political level between what we hope to achieve and what actually comes out at the end. But that's democracy, of course. So thanks, Niels. I pick up particularly on your point there, where you mentioned about stability of framework as well. I think we all appreciate your honesty from a political perspective with your comments about politicians too. But joking aside though, you raised a point there about stability of framework as well. And, and the energy price issue, of course, is a key one. So I've understood from you that this attempt to jump towards 2050 without enough of a dose of practicality from your perspective is a dangerous game that when trying to maximize environmental benefit, you can end up with some quite unforeseen, but very significant or potentially significant and foreseen socioeconomic impacts at the same time. We already see discussions at the European and national level now about energy poverty already this winter. With that in mind, then I'm gonna move over to Camilla and then to Julian again for your initial view. So Camilla, from the company perspective, representing industry on this panel, what does a company such as Veolia need to, need to have in place to be able to plan its investment cycles? Neil's mentioned the need obviously from the, the company side, the industry player side, to have some stability for investment. What do you need for that? And how are you planning your activities as a company in view of the Fit for 55 and Green Deal objectives? Um, thank you, David, for, for those questions. If you don't mind, I will maybe um, inverse the order of my replies. Um, so very quickly, just wanted to set the uh, the context, we as Veolia, we are a quite particular player. Um, we've just merged with uh, part of Suez to create a global leader of ecological transformation. Um, our uh, key objective of this operation is to create an offer that will be able to um, answer the uh, needs of our clients um, and all stakeholders that are involved in our ecosystems. And the main, uh, I think, distinguishing feature of our company is that we operate uh, three distinct, uh, uh, distinct activities, which is water uh, management, waste management, and energy management. So our um, expertise is not only within these three, um, three sectors, but also we uh, try and uh, try to value the synergies between those. And um, most importantly, what we think is the solution to the current problems is to act at a local level, which we call a local energy loop of energy, where you will use all available resources, including in particular uh, biomass and also bio biogenic uh, part of 
uh, waste, which is, for example, uh, municipal waste or refuse derived fuels, which are very important in our, our, our energy mix. Um, so this is a very short introduction just to set the, the, the context, the framework. Um, in order to reply to your question regarding uh, the 2050 um, horizon, um, this is something which is particularly important to us. Uh, but as a company, we have to have uh, a, a rather shorter horizon, which uh, is based on intermediary targets. Uh, one of the key um, elements that we uh, that helps us to plan for 2050 is the fact that in 2021 we joined the science-based target initiative and we committed to reduce um, scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent by 2034 from 2018 and we also committed to a net zero target for 2050 which means that our strategic investment plan, which is called Impact 23, is crafted to reach those objectives. And we identified um, activities in which we want to accelerate, in which we want to optimize and develop, and we want to reduce in order to achieve 2050 net zero. And um, in these uh, various activities that we identified, obviously, bioenergy and um, energy from from waste is a, a key uh, resource that we want to valorize. Um, to go back to your um, first question, which is what do we need in order to be able to do that? I think um, one thing that we need to remember is that biomass in general um, it has a great potential, as it was said, um, and greatly presented by Enrique uh, at the beginning. Um, it's, it's, it's a great asset, but it needs to be preserved, protected, and well exploited um, with a very precise mid and long term vision for its management. From our side, we have several projects in development currently, which are based, for example, on recycled wood. Uh, we are one. We have one project in Germany, one project in France, um, and what is the most important issue for us is to ensure stable costs and availability of resource. Um, obviously, securing, securing land and uh, land and permits for future development, um, but also a very predictable support mechanism for those fuels. And we are talking both about bioenergy, when we talk about bioenergy and the using for of biomass, for example, for heat and energy production, this is an extremely capex intensive investment. Just to give you an idea of uh, how much the difference is, a capex for a heating plan uh, for biomass uh, use is uh, 500 to um, 900,000 uh, euro um, per megawatt, uh, while it's 100,000 uh, euro for natural gas. So the difference is major. Hence, there is a need to ensure a support framework that will support investment. Uh, we have a great example with what is called Fonds Chaleur in France, which is an investment uh, tool to support initial investment in, in, in low carbon energy and district heating in particular. And also we are very much in need of a long term offtake contracts, for example, for green gas, which is produced for from um, from bio related uh, resources. And obviously, I think uh, there is uh, no doubt about the need for having a very certain and clear uh, framework regarding sustainability criteria of biomass. Um, we don't want to have a situation where we cannot take an investment decision and our investment decisions are being stifled because we don't know where we are going with the framework right now. Um, just for the reminder, the sustainability criteria, and as Jean-Marc just said at the beginning of our webinar, this is an extraordinary uh, opportunity, and I, I absolutely agree with him. Mm. From our point of view, the only issue that we have is that this framework was created only uh, three years ago, and we just didn't have a time not only to implement it, but once implemented, we didn't have a time to test it and to know how it really works. And now we are... 
uh, actually going back to the drawing board and we are starting again and trying to figure out what will be even stri uh, stricter uh, sustainability criteria. So um, this is not to criticize the need for sustainability criteria. We absolutely, even before they were um, defined, we had already our strict traceability rules regarding biomass we were using. But what is actually very, um, very asked for from the industry is to have something that will give us a strong basis in order to plan for our investment. Because in order well, to- Can I pause able... you there a little, Camilla, with yes. that thought? Because I want to bring Julian in as well. And we'll open up on that a little bit in discussion. Well noted, though, your point that from your side, you need short, medium to long term, that stability of framework to facilitate the sort of investments that from your side as a company, you need to be able to move forward. And with that in mind, if you don't mind, I'll give the floor over to Julian now and let Julian also give us his initial views. Uh, particularly, Julian, building on what we've heard from Katerina, of course, from Niels and from Camilla too. I know in your role at VUB, I mentioned a little your areas of expertise in introduction, but I know you're also working on the BEST project. Correct me if I'm wrong, that's the Belgian Energy System Transition Project. So really looking at how that transition can work on a, on a national level. Um, based on your experience, obviously, in your expertise, but also your role in BEST, how do you see the role of biomass moving forward in terms of system integration? What opportunities do you see? And of course, any other points you'd like to briefly mention in respect to what you've heard from other other speakers as well. Yeah, so very briefly about the best project that the purpose is to, to, to manage to model the, the energy system of a country like Belgium, uh, taken as, as a first example. So it, it's a federal Belgian project funded by the Energy Transition Funds, together with other Belgian universities. And the idea is to, to build a model where all resources are considered and different technologies to convert those resources into energy or material are um, uh, models. So you, you find there wind, sun, nuclear power, hydrogen, anything that could be imported, uh, fossil fuels, of course, and, and biomass, uh, among others. And then you have all technologies, boilers, uh, cars, or whatever, uh, to deliver electricity, heat, uh, mobility, and products. And we have one researcher, I think he's in the audience, Martin Collat, working on a specific case of biomass. And he, he modeled actually what could be the role of biomass in the energy transition in Belgium. And what we do actually is ask the model, what is the most cost-effective system? What's the, most, the best mix of energy uh, technologies and resources that you see, given a certain constraints in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? And then what we do, we decrease progressively the, uh, the, um, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we allow. And you see there something very interesting, somehow related to what Niels said about the transition period, is that the role of bioenergy will evolve in time. Because of course, we all know that bioenergy covers a broad range of resources and a broad range of technologies, which means an extremely broad range of technological, technological pathways. You can, you can combine different resources with different technologies to deliver different products. And that's, that's, that's a great advantage of, of bioenergy. And what we see from the Martin's results is that what we do today with bioenergy is not what we are going to do with bioenergy within 10 years, and it's not what we are going to do with bioenergy within 20 years. So in the end, there is a time evolution of the role of bioenergy as a versatile source of energy and other products in time. And, and that's very interesting to mention briefly the main results. I will keep it, keep it brief, but we see an evolution from low temperature heat domestic heat for the moment that will be replaced by heat pumps and then biomass will move to high temperature heat and then um, when the demand for non-energy uh, products like biomaterials will increase then biomass will move to the production of high temperature heat and electricity to support the network using low rate resources actually so it means this gives also perspective for the industry uh, and it's also related what, with what was just said, there will be an evolution and we can somehow predict what will be the role of bioenergy in time, actually. And that's very important to, to keep in mind that a technology and certainly bioenergy is not frozen in time. It has challenges today, but the challenges will not be the same tomorrow and the technologies will not be the same tomorrow. You're muted. <laughs> Indeed. Trying to link the perspective you've just given us there, that picking up on what we heard from Niels as well, 
that obviously the role of, of any particular part of the energy mix is clearly going to evolve with time. And as Neil's pointed out, it's not just a jump from point A to point B in 2050, and you've included biomass in that. I'm linking that a little with the policy perspective then, uh, Julian, from your perspective, if there's a policy framework when it comes to energy transition, what for you then, how, how do you resolve the issue you've raised that obviously the role of bioenergy, like other types of things in the energy mix, is going to evolve over time? How can you build that sort of flexibility into a policy framework that it's not on the one side too open, but on the other side, not too close, that it stifles this. Have you got any practical recommendations for that? Because I'm going to ask the same question, both to Katerina, to Niels and to Camilla as well. Okay, we've raised a lot of good points here about the need for coherence, flexibility that facilitates investment, and all these different important elements. But practically speaking, how do we do that? So any, any, any tasters from you on that? I think you need to segregate between uh, different timeframes. Um, I mean, the first time to, to do in terms of policies is to address the current challenges of the current technologies that are used for bioenergy. That's one thing to do on the short term. And then you need to uh, address this um, using the knowledge from industry and also the perspective of industry together with scientists. It is a very applied field of research, so high maturity level. But then, of course, you have to look at the future and see what the models predict and say, OK, look, in the future, we might need a flexible and efficient technology to do this with that type of feedstock. And then there you need to invest in research to enable the development of those technology that you will need based on uh, the need that you have um, that you have highlighted as a result of, of the models, actually. So I would highlight this work high with a, on high mature, highly mature technology to address the, the, the current challenges, but at the same time, looking forward and enable future technologies to be developed. Okay, thanks, Julian. Well, with that in mind, then I'm going to bring in Katerina, Niels, Camilla, over to you. Who wants to pick up on this side? We've already got a practical suggestion. Niels, I'll give the floor to you. And then, well, Katerina, it's all yours, okay? I think we have a, a very practical issues. One of the starting points for, for me when I started to critically think about how I thought myself started with hydrogen because I went to different reports about what a hydrogen society would need in investments on different parts of the, of, of, of the network, different parts of it. And I came up with a fairly depressive, uh, depressive picture of hydrogen being actually up for grabs on a practical level 2035. And that was sort of the moment when I saw the light in the tunnel, sort of. If we are going to wait for hydrogen un until 2035, mm. then we need to find solutions up to 2035. And, and the interesting, and, and here I'm, I was very carefully listening to Julian, because I think one of the thoughts we have to understand there is that the industry is going to need different way of experimenting with new technology. They can't, the new technology isn't coming sort of uh, by Ting Ling coming with her, with her magic wand. So, so we also have to give the industry a possibility to experiment, to find new solutions, because if they aren't allowed to experiment with different sorts of, of, of hydrogen or different forms of biomass, then nothing will come off. So we, we have to understand that this is not just we politicians making the bright and intelligent and big de 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 decisions. We have to understand that somebody is there struggling with a reality. And if we don't understand how this reality looks, then we are probably making the stupid decisions. I was already warning you about that. So that's my take. Okay, okay. And just a little comeback there, Niels, before I bring Katharina in as well. I mean, one, one of the points we heard from Jean-Marc at the beginning was this concept of evidence-based. And obviously, there's a lot of debate. I mean, when we saw the Deloitte report before, understandably, some civil society representatives in the, in the Q&A are fielding questions along the lines of, okay, but, you know, who paid for that report? And, and how, how, how evidence-based is it? How, how true is it? And, and I'm a big fan of the old lies, damn lies and statistics argument. Isn't there a risk 
when it comes to something like revising red that, that you know which which evidence are we listening to yeah because if we don't take an evidence-based approach or we don't take a holistic approach to considering all the evidence isn't there a risk again we take the wrong pathway well uh, there's a phoenix saying uh, life is very risky and it usually ends with death <laughs> so you can't, you can't you can't you can't sort of uh, escape the risks but i think that 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 the um, the reality check is the, the basic thing. You have to go out in, into the reality and you have to look at the reality and not just live in a room with very ideological uh, concepts around you. Because if, uh, if you make all your decisions on, on based on ideological uh, concepts, then, then I'm pretty sure that you are going to end up with something which doesn't work. So go go in. Uh, that's my sort of go into the reality. Look at the reality, and the reality looks very different in different member states. So there is not one reality. Mm. We Finns probably have a tendency to think our reality is the most valuable reality. That's probably not either true, but but we have to see the different forms of reality and find a solution which are helping us to in those steps reach a, a situation where we can where we can say, okay, we, are, we have done some big decision about being uh, carbon neutral to 2050, and we shouldn't back off from them, but we should understand in which reality setting it's, it's going to happen. So from your side then, good policy for you, if I've understood correctly, would be a, an amalgam, if you like, with that Finnish saying in mind, but an amalgam of an evidence base, but driven by strong ambition, but supported by a good robust evidence base. Okay, interesting. Yes, stuff. Sure, and, and and listening to the NGOs at the same time—that's part of that's part of the reality. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, Catherine, we've heard a lot of points coming up there. I'll pass it over to you for some reflections on your side. Thanks, and uh, you just uh, used exactly the right word. These are reflections from my side, so these are not uh, you know fixing stone and certainly not commission uh, positions. But um, I think what what we have there, you know, if you think about. Um, the so-called mobile phone you could have in your hand 20 years ago, I mean, which weighed its five kilos <laughs> or something, and you hardly could make a phone call with it. Mm. And what you now have in your pocket, uh, which is you know, probably more powerful than your computer at the time. So technology is moving rapidly, and, and which means that we cannot fix the solutions for the future today. So even looking at 20 years from today into the future is can be extremely far away. So, but at the same time, we have urgency. We need to urgently act on climate change, but we also at the same time need to urgently act on biodiversity loss. So what we need to somehow build into the process is the target, the target we know where we want to go, uh, flexibility, um, I think Niels mentioned also different realities. Uh, if we look at Europe, our member states are very different one from the other, and their resources are different, uh, their starting points are different. So also then looking at the path from this diversity point of view, it cannot be one size fit all and there is no silver bullet. So acting on where we know that we are going rapidly in the right direction, but keeping the flexibility there to deviate from the course if we find better solutions or, or that the, the, the route was not the best one. Can I take that then? I I'm, mean, I'm I've used the word reflections deliberately, obviously. I'm, we're not asking you as we're not asking Niels to set, you know, Renew Europe policy here in this forum. We're not asking you to rewrite commission policy here live. But if I understood correctly, then you, you, you feel very much that the policy framework really has to have and has to facilitate a good level of subsidiarity to allow for that flexibility? Um, subsidiarity with the meaning, of course, that when decisions are best taken at be it national or local level, then yes, but uh, making sure then that uh, we also have a, have a, a Europe, um, that everybody stays on course uh, and, uh, and uh, everybody also contributes uh, uh, in a fair way into reaching the targets. Uh, so subsidiarity doesn't mean that you get off the hook uh, uh, in 
Yeah, no, your, I'm with you. It's uh, a much maligned term sometimes where subsidiarity can be read sometimes as excessive freedom and not non-compliance with, if you like, a broader broader concept of policy. Camilla, Julian, I'll bring you in at this stage and then I've got a couple of questions from our audience that I really want to pose to you. Camilla, any reflections from your side at this stage on what we've heard? Yeah, uh, I'm actually very happy with what I hear, if I can say that, um, because uh, we are pretty much aligned uh, with the approach of policymakers in the sense that, uh, as I've already said, we need something, your initial question was what do we need uh, as a political framework and also the process of policymaking, of designing the policy in order to be able to accommodate the fact that the solutions that we have today and the technologies we have today will not be the same in 10 and 20 years time as Julien has said. And I think uh, the keywords are, have already been said and I will just maybe remix them with uh, Alassos uh, Villoya, uh, meaning that, as I've already said, a stable framework is necessary for a short-term investment decision, but also long-term investment decisions. The investment decisions we make today will define our capability of meet 2030 targets that the European Commission has set. So we need to know where we are going today with the framework we will have. And I, I also said that evidence-based is the key. And in that regard, I was mentioning the sustainability criteria. We need to be able to draw on the experience of already implementing those sustainability criteria in order to have even better and more performing framework that will answer the needs both of industry and also NGOs. As, as Niels uh, mentioned, we need to hear them. We need to make a, a policy that is not idealistic, that is reality evidence-based, but we also need to hear people who are have a vision, which is quite difficult to imagine today. Um, and I think another um, challenge is to make sure that this framework is also not only stable, but at the same time flexible enough to allow for a innovation that, as Julian said, is is being done today currently by operator operator as Violia, working with university, working with scientists, and um, I think in that particular area we have a great opportunity to create. A, a new framework through the revision of uh, renewable directive and also energy efficiency directive um, in order to create something that will implement the vision of energy system integration that was laid down in 2020 by the European Commission in its communication. We need a framework that will be flexible, that would enable synergies between different sectors uh, when we talk sectors for VLA is waste, water, energy, but this is also between transports, between buildings, between industry. Uh, one of the great examples is, for example, heat recovery from industry using used in in um, in district heating that that we operate. We need to have a framework at the EU level that will allow us for making this experimentation and pushing them forward. And I also mentioned um, our impact 2000, uh, 2023, in which we have those activities which we need to reduce, which are mostly fossil fuels, we need to uh, optimize and we need to accelerate in. And this reflect what the, the categorization that Julian already mentioned, that um, they are immediate major technology we need to optimize today in order to enable us to implement uh, more innovative uh, and not mature enough technologies that we will need in 2030-2035 horizon, as Niels uh, mentioned, for hydrogen, but it's also the CCS uh, applied to bioenergy, the BEX solution. Um, it's something that is already oper operational, but we will need more time. Well, can I come in, Camilla, on this idea of, of bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, yeah. and also the idea of biochar? Because this is a question I wanted to bring up for everybody. The points you've made are noted, and thank you for those. Julian, just before I bring you in as well, it's a question here for everybody, um, because obviously one question that was coming up also strongly from the civil society side when we heard Enrique's presentation was, do the models that are used and it was also referring to were the models in the Commission's own modelling uh, and perhaps in ENVI committee discussions as well, Niels. Um, 
are they factoring in a use of carbon capture and storage in the modeling? And are they assuming that this CCS technology works? Because one level of one, one argument that comes from civil society is it's not, they, the argument is it's not a proven technology. So, I mean, I'm interested to hear people's views on that particular aspect, because I think it's one of the great points of contention when we talk about things like bioenergy in the future energy mix. So, Julian, I'll bring you in on that from the yeah. academic perspective, but I'm interested, Niels, to hear from you on that too. So, Ju so Julian, on the CCS issue, how do you see that? Well, first of all, in terms of carbon capture, CCS is a proven technology on site. I mean, we can, it's perfectly possible, maybe not 100%, but to capture a significant part of the CO2 that is emitted from combustion process, uh, from fossil fuels or, or biomass. The question afterwards, what do you do with the CO2? Do you store it? Do you find another use for it? Can you build material based on it? Um, so the capture itself is mature. Uh, the business case might not be there. And the, the utilization or the storage of, of, of uh, CO2 is also uh, still a challenge. Um, so, of course, you can say it's not a material technology, so we should not count on it, but just look at the mix of energy that is foreseen by all international associations. Uh, a lot of technologies that are mentioned there are not mature yet, um, and, and we rely on some technologies for which there are still challenges, and we just rely on science and industrial development to address those challenges. So, you, you should welcome all those technologies the same way. I, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's, not a, um, it's not a contest between the technologies. They all have their challenges that we have to work on. Um, also, of course- yes, I think this links a little bit what we heard from Niels before, and correct me if I'm wrong, Niels, but it sounds a little bit me, to me sometimes like when we talk about which technology will help us best in our energy transition, it sounds to me like trying to choose one horse to bet on in a race instead of betting on, let's say, at least half of the horses, knowing then that someone's going to finish in a reasonable position for us. Nils, what's your take on that? Well, as I said already earlier, when I listened to, to the rest of the, the, uh, the, the panel, uh, there, there is a lot of hesitation in, in the ENVI committee about different technologies. And I think that's for good reason, because some technologies go, go in the wrong direction or they doesn't uh, mature in, in, in due time. But if we aren't experimenting, and that's, I think, what I took out of, uh, of Julian's speech, or that if we don't have the courage to, to try out different technologies, then we won't ever, ever reach the, the goal because no technology has been mature from the very beginning. Uh, and no politician has actually been mature from the very beginning. So we are in the same boat. And so we have to understand that, that things mature, sometimes faster, sometimes less fast. Katarina told us about the, 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 the phone. Uh, when, I, when I had my first computer, that was a much, more, much dumber computer than this phone is for the moment being. Uh, and so there is a lot of things going on and uh, to guess about the time frames for those, those different developments that's that's not my part but but uh, to stay open for experimentation that's that's uh, if we don't do that then we then we shut the door and, and we don't need open doors okay i want to bring in now a question that's been coming up from quite a number of different people in our audience I want to bring in now a few of these audience questions to bring us a little bit towards the end. And it's about investment. Um, it's about what should the role be uh, within the policy making that's going on now within the Green Deal framework in terms of investment. Is it the role, and I'll put this first, Katharina, to you, is it the role of the Green Deal to give a very clear stability for investment? Is it the role of the Green Deal to guide investment? Or is it the role of the Green Deal, as one person put in the question, to get out of the way and let people get on with things? Thanks. Uh, I think that is the key question, because without investments, uh, we will not change our system. So, and, uh, and the way we approach it is that the Green Deal, with all the legal pieces, but also then complemented with different financing instruments that we have, we should facilitate, we should accelerate uh, investments in these different uh, green 
technologies that we have been discussing today. Uh, but then at the same time, as we have also been discussed, we must leave the door open for innovation. We actually need to stimulate innovation uh, for it to be even, even faster. So the aim of the Green Deal then uh, would be to uh, help investors uh, get their good projects up and running, support them uh, together with permitting uh, uh, at the same time, of course, uh, in order then to uh, get us to the uh, target we have. And I think what has been very clear from what I've heard today from the panelists is that um, we should be able to keep um, open mind and not to select one or two technologies today because the world will inevitably be different. Uh, so we have to be sure that the innovation happens and, uh, and fast. So thanks. Okay, and Camilla, I'd, I'd like your reflections on what we've just heard in relation to investment. You brought up the issue of investment stability through the policy framework before that's required from your side as an industry player. And you mentioned permitting and other in, in issues that Katharina's touched upon. So what's your reflection on what you've just heard? Well, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be original, bit, but I agree <laughs> here. I should be a dissident, but I'm, I'm not. Um, we definitely see Green Deal as a trigger as a fuel for investment. We are looking at the recovery plans, uh, and I think it will be very difficult to avoid the very controversial topic, and I will throw it out there, of the taxonomy, of the green taxonomy, that is about to be uh, being finalized as we speak, especially regarding nuclear and gas, uh, which definitely is a key, uh, a, 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 an indicator where the money should go regarding green investment. So in that regards, as a company, we are definitely looking as a uh, as a green deal, as a as a as a guidance where uh, a the money will be available, and also where our investment should go, uh, and towards which objectives we are looking at all pieces of Fit for 55 in that regards, because they are setting a very clear targets for renewable, for energy, um, for renewable, uh, for energy efficiency, uh, for sustainable fuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, uh, and I just wanted to make a link with the issue of CCS because the two topics are um, very much related. I do agree with Julien that CCS is a proofed technology, it works, but where it didn't work is the fact that it doesn't work without a very important uh, public support, especially in the initial phase of investment, but also on the OPEX side of the operational side of investment. We had several projects that were supported by the EU and we have uh, seen that they didn't work because there was no sufficient support and mainly also because the CO2 price was not uh, enough in order to make those projects viable. We are in a completely different context today. A, because the use of CCS has changed uh, we are not only looking at the use of CCS on the electricity production side for fossil fuels, but also in the case of Vilia, we are looking at how we can, for example, apply CCS to uh, incineration facilities uh, or energy recovery facilities to reduce our CO2 emissions. Also, because we have a much higher CO2 price that was never as high as it is uh, today. And also because uh, the European Commission is putting on the table a very concrete tools that we are seeing, for example, contracts for difference, which are mentioned in the revision of uh, state aid rules and also are mentioned in the revision of the EU ETS directive. And they will definitely be extremely positive for um, the maturity of the business model, as, as Julian said, we need a mature business model that will be supported enough uh, for BECs to play a key role in the transition towards 2050, along with other technologies. Okay, thanks. Now, we've reached that point, ladies and gentlemen, it's about seven or eight minutes to our four o'clock sort of ending point. This is one of those debates, obviously, where we've opened quite a Pandora's box. We've got a lot of threads here. It's always the case with something like this. Our aim was to look at some forward-looking solutions to try and find some consensus on the sort of policy framework we need. There seems to be some commonality coming out here about the need for flexibility in the policy making, about the need for stability, about the need for the facilitation of investments within it. We've also heard 
about the need for uh, technology being invested in and the idea that it's not a case of knowing what the winner is before we run the race, but actually trying to spread our bets a little on a range of opportunities of technology to help us make this very challenging transition away from fossil fuels in the future. I want to bring things together a little bit now. I want to have very brief closing reflections from each of you, possibly with one or two, what you see is the most important points to bear in mind in terms of what role does bioenergy have moving forward into the future under the Green Deal? And what are the opportunities that we have with bioenergy moving forward? So I'm going to start off, if you'll allow me, Niels, I'll ask you to go first, Camilla, and then Julian and Katharina, I'll, let, I'll ask you to close things off for us. And then for our audience, we'll just hear a couple of brief reflections from Julia Kankan from Bioenergy Europe, just to wrap things up. So Niels, over to you. Thank you, David. Well, I think that what makes it slightly different or difficult with, with bioenergy is that bioenergy is so closely related to biodiversity. And we have to find solutions on those both issues, as, as Katarina said. And, and when you look at discussion, how it's going on, I can understand that young people, they are almost dead afraid of what's, going, what's happening in the field of biodiversity. At the same time, we should probably also understand that biodiversity is also changing in, in, by natural means. If you go back to Darwin and his uh, finks on, on, from Galapagos Islands, then what he saw what was that that things change uh, and 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 in those changes some birds are going to to sort of fly to uh, the heaven of birds but but uh, but still that's part of development so uh, even if biodiversity is at risk uh, well as i said before life is always a risky business and that goes for for all of us and if we don't get these two parts together the biodiversity and the bio the bioeconomy then then we are then we are in risk really risky uh, situation and that's probably the, the worst could, uh, which could happen okay so it's about maintaining and having the right balance in the way we move forward with things okay uh, julian Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, if I had to to highlight something, um, the end of this debate indeed is is the complexity of bioenergy. Yeah, I think I, I would dare to say that it's the most complex source of renewable energy, but it's also the most versatile one. So it means that there are challenges ahead, but also a lot of possibilities. And we should ask the right question, which is not biomass yes or no, but biomass where and when for what. And to do so, so I think it's also it was also highlighted during the debate to decide biomass where, when, and for what. You need a multi-stakeholder process. You need to put um, different stakeholders around the table: scientists, producers, end users, politicians, NGOs, citizens, and 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 discuss what's the best or what is the best mix of bioenergy integrated in, in the best mix of energy in general, which is obviously not an easy question to answer. But this is what I would like to add, a complex debate, complex uh, uh, resource, but a lot of possibilities. That's, that's the beauty of it. It's echoing a little what we heard earlier about opportunity, but I take your point, I think we all take your point as well, that obviously complex situations and complex challenges like decarbonisation require complex solutions rather than overly simple ones. Camilla, over to you. Um regarding both those aspects taking into consideration biodiversity and also uh, the diversity of usages of biomass from our point of view it is also important to go down to the local level and putting together around the table stakeholders at the local level because it's the best way in order to both address the most uh, obvious environmental uh, challenges at the local level but as well try to find the best usage for the available resources that we have at hand and also plan for the future. We see that the European Commission is 
actually going in that direction because in the EED it proposes, for example, uh, uh, a local planification for heat strategy, which is very close to that uh, that uh, methodology, and we can only uh, encourage that and be sort of facilitator of that process. And I think. The, the policy framework needs to be stable, flexible, but also allow for a local level to be a, a voice of this process of finding the best solutions that are adapted for each community. Okay, so again, that flexibility that we talked about before and you highlighted as well, and the stability of framework. So Katharina, over to you. Thanks, David, and also thanks to my co-panelists. Uh, I mean, there is not much I could add at least not much what would be original. <laughs> so uh, maybe just come back to uh, what was said at some point of the discussion that we, when we do policy, uh, we need analysis and we need to have a solid fact-based uh, assessment of uh, what happens. And then there are inevitably trade-offs that need to be made. I mean, if these decisions were easy, we would not be discussing here. There will be difficult decisions which have pros and cons, costs and benefits, uh, etc. Uh, and, and here um, we need then, based on uh, the discussion then that inevitably needs to take place uh, uh, with the stakeholders, there needs to be courage, be it then by policymakers or politicians uh, to take decisions which do have benefits, but they often do have side effects, they have these negative aspects, and we have to acknowledge it. We are not in a world where we have only uh, solutions which are good for everybody. Uh, we need to take the courage and say that, yes, this is where we need to go. Uh, it has these positive effects. It helps us uh, mitigate climate change, but it also has some negative impact. And this is the trade-offs, and this is the reason why we go this route. So I think we also need to uh, have a more thorough discussion on uh, why we take certain decisions and not to try to say that this is the best technology and this is the only one because there is no such silver bullet. Thank you. So a clear message from your side that we're looking for best fit rather than an ideal perfection. A little link with what we heard from Niels before about the need to have a mature and evidence-based debate on these things. Well, with those thoughts in mind, I think we could debate this for quite a lot longer, I'm sure, and be original as well. But I thank you all. Thank you, Katharina, thank you, Niels, thank you, Julian, and also Camilla for your time today and taking part in this debate with us. So a very big thank you to you uh, for taking the time and, and bringing your thoughts to this obviously challenging debate. And with that in mind, I'll ask you now to switch off your cameras and microphones and allow me to bring in Julia Cancane from Bioenergy Europe, just for some last reflections on what we've heard. So Julia, are you there with us? Yes, I am. Excellent, great. Well, I've got really one simple question just to wrap things up in a timely manner for us, which is this. I mean, we've heard a lot of points coming up in the debate today, as they always would. Um, we've heard the comments about, obviously, the need for flexibility, subsidiarity, uh, among many, many others. Bringing things together from your side, I know you were following the debate today. What for you are the most important prospects for the bioenergy industry? And what do you think the sector needs to take away specifically and prioritized from today's debate? Uh, not, an easy, uh, not an easy question indeed. Um, not at all. <laughs> uh, but first of all, uh, the first point, and I think it's a, a very important one, bioenergy is part of, of any uh, climate neutral future. Uh, but in order to achieve uh, this kind of future and this kind of objectives, uh, we need to focus and understand that we're present as well. So at the moment, uh, the pace and uh, the scale of uh, the clean energy transition is not in line with the climate targets. Um, so uh, the Fit for 55 package represents a huge opportunity uh, to, to get things straight. Um, I just want to uh, give a bit of a step back. Two days ago, uh, the European Commission uh, published some very interesting piece of data it was about uh, the uh, national objectives on uh, renewable energy. And we see that the best performers in Europe are the ones that have a very high share of bioenergy in their mix. And I think this is a very important signal. Uh, when we heard um, from four very different speakers today is that, of course, we need clarity and coherence uh, from policymakers, but also policy design is not done in a void. And, and this is rightly so. 
So we need a multi-stakeholder uh, process in order to get a solid uh, policy design. Our companies uh, in the bioenergy sector are actually pioneering uh, the traceability and sustainability requirements. And this will be increasingly important uh, for the future, not only for us, but in all value chains. Um, and um, finally, uh, we need to listen to the scientists um, and take seriously the modeling, uh, because if we don't, we won't be able to achieve our targets. And at the same time, industry must uh, remain uh, ready uh, to evolve and to answer to this kind of environmental and societal challenges. So uh, I think this is on my side. Okay, well, thanks for your summary, Julia. I'm going to take that as a, as a close for today. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, our audience for the questions they've sent in, which we've done our best to try and pose. Thank you also to all our speakers, of course, uh, for taking part in today's debate. And I wish you all, ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant evening, wherever you may be. And we look forward to further dialogue with you, whichever sector or whichever uh, group you represent in the future on what are obviously challenging but essential issues. Thank you very much.